lovers, and welcome to the Liberty Mike podcast, broadcasting from an undisclosed location in the heart of Dixie. I am Michael, and I am here with Liberty Larry. How's it going? Doing okay. How are you? Pretty good. Yeah. Nice weather. <laughs> yeah, it is. It was supposed to rain all day. Yeah, it didn't. It only <laughs> rained half the day. <laughs> yeah, barely even that. Oh, it rained pretty good this morning. Oh, did it? And it well, didn't it did work. here. Didn't where I was at. Yeah. I mean, it rained, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't use the words "pretty good." <laughs> it did also get already get hotter than it was supposed to get all day. Yeah. Um, I mean, it was hotter when I came home than it was supposed to have gotten all day. And that was yeah. late afternoon, you know. Yeah, uh, they can't predict it, man. They don't know what's going on. No. Yep. But never mind. I'm not. I'm not gonna <laughs> you, go want, there. you want to go on a whole no, long I'm journey? Not gonna, I'm not going to go there. Uh, we'll, we can do it. We'll Today's the one, day. We'll leave that one alone. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. <clears throat> not I did um, want to mention that we we forgot to talk about uh, last week the calls from um, government U.S. government officials for Netanyahu to step down. Oh, yeah. That was kind of interesting. Um, my only comment on that really is that, well, once again, it, it, it's back around to the Democrat Party is greatly divided on the Israel-Palestine question. Oh, yeah. It's it's a problem for them going <clears throat> into this election. Um, I mean, generally, the Democrats are pretty good at like rallying the troops behind them, but this one's going to be tough. Yeah, because I, they're very split on this, and the, both sides are pretty passionate about their position on it. Well, you don't. It's not like you can go vote for Trump and get your way if you're opposed to the Democrat position on Israel Palestine. It's yeah. the same thing either way. So I don't. I don't actually think that it makes a difference. That it's like the hurt worst anybody. thing that happens is that somebody doesn't go to the polls. But I don't think. I mean, the yeah. the people you're talking about mostly in that situation are young people who it's kind generally of generally don't. That's baked in. Yeah, it's a it's a coin flip whether they'll go to the polls or not anyway yeah there's probably some truth to so, that so um but uh the the comment that i wanted to make on it actually is that you know we can't help but meddle and ask for a regime change even among our allies, <laughs> allies? <laughs> yeah no there's definitely something to that <laughs> we're not yeah. getting our way exactly uh ally you should elect a new somebody else we <laughs> can help <laughs> right <laughs> or something i don't know it was just it, that it, stood out to it me is it is strange um especially i mean i figure a lot of that's got to be orchestrated i'm sure he didn't just make the decision to go up there and do that speech i'm sure he was in contact with the biden administration and that yeah, sort and of probably thing. some um some polling groups that they're like well this will play well with the base <laughs> yeah exactly <laughs> or something yeah. i well, you know, we're not calling for them to stop their genocide exactly, but we're at least asking for somebody who's less unlikable to be in charge. <laughs> All right. I don't know. Uh, um, they're definitely walking the tightrope on that right now. Yeah. Uh, Putin was reelected. Yeah. He got something like 87% of the vote, which immediately makes everybody in the West say, oh, it's all rigged and blah, blah, blah. I, I heard one of the, oh, what was it? Um, one of the stations I listened to, they said he gave himself 87% of the vote. It was like just like assuming that, that it was rigged. <laughs> yeah, um, I'm going to take go out on a limb here and call it independent polling inside of Russia. And when I say independent, I mean... National Endowment for Democracy-funded organization doing polling in Russia, yeah. which makes it far from being independent. It's a U.S. government-sponsored polling group in Russia. Um, you know, did a, a poll and came up with something like eighty-five, or actually, I think it was eighty-six percent approval for Putin going into this election. Yeah, and then he got eighty-seven percent of the vote, so it seems to be in line looks with his like approval. It, yeah, it looks like it kind of adds up, right? It, it's incredible how how hard people have worked in the West to convince everyone that this guy is despised and is only there because <coughs> he's a complete authoritarian. He's wildly popular in Russia. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, he, is, it yeah, is what it is. Like. Yeah, he just is. He's wildly popular in Russia. Um, he's done, he, he is, they see him as a savior in a lot of ways, I think. 
Yeah. Um, he came in and stamped out a lot of the really terrible corruption that was happening after the fall of the Soviet Union. Yeah. Um, he has built Russia back up into a world power. Yeah. Uh, from the depths after the fall of the Soviet Union, that place was a complete disaster for like a decade. Yeah. And uh, I mean, he's been on the whole very good for the Russian people, and they recognize it. Yeah. It's kind of a shame to me because, like, I'm not like a huge Putin fan. But well, no, I mean, he, but I, this is not to say that he's a good person. No. I, I know that that's immediately what people are. Oh, you're just praising Putin. Well, no, but it, it does seem to me, particularly like after 9/11, there have been opportunities where the West really could have brought him into the fold. Oh yeah, and and we could be living in a different planet right now mm-hmm. if if. Even just like a little bit, like gave him, cut him a little bit of slack. But like we've had no interest in doing that from the word go. Yeah, he was absolutely prepared to be friends with the West. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm not saying that that's a perfect world because like, like I don't want countries getting along too good. Like I don't want like new world order stuff, like one world government. But like I do want peace. Yeah, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> well, that that's where you're at odds with the ruling elite. Yeah, well, wanting peace. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, one hundred percent agree. Like, um, um, you know, war makes a lot of people a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Now it's not better for all of us. Like, oh yeah, of course. You know, <laughs> it's the, not better if your kid's the one going to war. Well, that's true too, but it's also it sucks a bunch of capital out of the system that could go into something far more beneficial and useful. Well, absolutely. Um, this is the Bastiat seen and unseen. That's the unseen. Like all that money that gets sucked out of our economy to go blow stuff up halfway around the world is is money could've, that could have been used to provide more consumer goods or build more housing. Or fill some of those potholes, mm-hmm. or do research, yeah, uh, you know, medical research, etc. I mean, this is all money that could have gone somewhere else, yeah, where it could have been more productive. But, um, but you know, if you're a, a contractor, uh, it's a it's a circular system. If you're a military contractor, you uh, lobby the government for money they take it from the taxpayer they give it to you you use part of that money to lobby the government for more money yeah. and of course the people that are in government they benefit from that lobby money yeah, right. <laughs> so nice dinners and gifts and who knows what else other kind of bribes are going on under the table yeah um but anyway yeah so uh we get another six years of of putin yeah screaming yeah I mean, screaming about Putin, not Putin screaming. But I've, I've actually never seen Putin scream about anything, really. <laughs> right, yeah. He seems like the type he doesn't really have to do all that to yeah. get his point across. He's like, tends to be cool and collected, so. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is where we are, no, I suppose. It's- it, it also benefits... The problem over the last... Uh, so I recommend people uh, read the Pentagon's new map. Because it talks about the military-industrial complex quest for a near-peer competitor. Because after the fall of the Soviet Union, we had the unipolar moment where the U.S. was far and away the most powerful country, um, and there weren't any real rivals at all. Yeah. Uh, eventually, China rose, and and then Russia again. Um, but the military industrial complex, they were looking, well, we have to keep these wars going, so that's why we were fighting in the Middle East. Problem is, that doesn't really earn a lot of money. Yeah. I'm not getting it's a lot of big small ticket arms, items. like little yeah. things. Yeah. The insurgent <laughs> wars aren't that great for the military industrial complex. They, you know, they pay the bills. Yeah. But um, it, it's nothing like buying, um, you know, fleets of submarines or carriers or, uh, you know, all the um, top tier jets to fight a near peer competitor. Yeah. You know, the F-22 is kind of wasted in Afghanistan against a country that doesn't have an air force. Right. <laughs> um, but it's not wasted against a, a Russia or a China yeah. that has a modern air force. Some would argue with that, but whatever. Yeah. Um, it's certainly at least more uh, justifiable. Right. <laughs> yeah. 
and uh, and so there there's been this quest to find the near peer competitor. Like you don't actually want anybody to become a peer competitor, but if you can create an antagonism with a near peer, then you can get more funding for bigger items. Yeah. You know, preparing to fight a war in the Pacific with China is a whole lot different than fighting in the mountains of Afghanistan or in the deserts of Syria. Yeah. It's just different. Yeah. Um, I guess that's all I have about that. Let's <laughs> let's get into our actual topics. Right? All right, yeah, because I was going to say, we didn't plan to talk about any of that. <laughs> no, no. No notes on the list for that one. No. Um, okay, so first I wanted to talk, because I, I find this case particularly interesting because I don't know I don't know what the right answer is on this like I'm not sure I'm like I'm really torn about this case which is the yeah. the uh, crumbly case which is <laughs> just kind of a funny name to me but um, the background is that the son uh, who was 15 at the time Ethan crumbly killed four in at the end of November 2021 at uh, Oxford High School in Michigan outside of Detroit Um. He was charged as an adult in the these murders and sentenced to life plus. Um, but in the last like month, maybe six weeks at this point, but anyway, very recently, yeah. um, both in separate trials, both of his parents have been independently convicted of involuntary manslaughter. And so when I first heard about this, I thought, oh, this is just that next step of trying to find somebody else to blame. Yeah, we need a scapegoat. Yeah, um, we tried to uh, we tried to go after the gun companies, the gun manufacturers for these kind of things, and that didn't work. Well, maybe we'll maybe we'll go after the parents now. Yeah, maybe that'll have an impact. Um, <laughs> but and so I, I was against it, and I, my my first thought was, okay, if this kid was tried as an adult and convicted of murder as an adult, then he was, then the legal system in America said that he was, um, making his own decisions. Yeah. Independently as an adult. And how can we possibly hold his parents accountable for his actions? If he's been considered to be making his own decisions freely as an adult. Yeah. You can't, it feels like to me, you can't have it both ways. Right. Um, so that was my thought too. Then I started reading into the details of this. Yeah. And I, I think I've I think I've <laughs> flipped here. Um I think that the parents may actually have some liability in this. Yeah. Because there was a whole lot of stuff that was just kind of ignored by them. Um they were they seemed to be kind of absentee, first off. Yeah. Uh didn't really know what was going on with the kid. They bought him the gun that, I mean, like for that him used, yeah. that he used, yeah. uh, nine millimeter. Took him out to the range a few days before. Showed him how to use it. Yeah, I mean, I suspect it sounds like they're people that like that wasn't their first time at the range, is what it sounds like. Um, yeah. So he probably already knew how to use it, but yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, now that in and of itself. I don't have an issue with because I grew up in a house with guns everywhere that were like loaded and ready to go. Yeah. Um, we were, my brother and I were taught very young how to handle guns, how to be safe with them and to respect them. Yeah. And we didn't have any issues. And well, and I think overall, most families are kind of the same way, not all, but like overall, like most kids, if they if they grow up around guns, they're used to handling them. Um, the guns can be around and in the house, and it's not going to cause any problems. But this is also outside of Detroit. This is a very different culture than the South. Exactly. Well, there's that too. Mm-hmm. Um, like I say, I, I like I say, I don't know. I, this I'm torn on this one because I'm a big believer in. Keeping your guns put up, keeping them away from the kids. Now, I want my kids to know how to use them. Like, I've shown, like, my kids have went to the range. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, they know how to handle a firearm. And then, like you were saying, they know how to respect one. Yeah. Um, But it's still, it, it the idea that, um, that somebody that's a minor could have unfettered access to a weapon like that, 
I think is dangerous. Well, uh, the gun was in a case, not in his room or whatever. Yeah. Um, there is evidence. It, it wasn't conclusive, I would say, but there is evidence that the case was not secured, like not locked down or anything. Yeah. Um, or or locked, period. Yeah. Uh, there were some other issues that I think are probably more important to the discussion here, which is um, like there were several references to mental health issues that he had had recently in these articles. It took me a little bit to actually track down what they were talking about. It was, yeah. uh, it kept being referenced in this kind of oblique way, but um, it, it turns out that he was having some hallucinations or it seems to have been having some hallucinations and right. that he had texted, sent text to his mom about some of these hallucinations. And she was just like, ah, whatever. He's just joking around or like not taking it seriously. Yeah. Um, now at the same time, the kid hadn't had any prior disciplinary problems. Yeah. Um, you know, he, it's not like he'd been a problem child or anything, yeah. but on the day of the, the, uh, the shooting, um, the parents had been brought into the school to meet with the principal, I guess. Um, because he had drawn a picture on some math work of uh, him with a gun and bullets and like bloody people and and it had phrases on it like blood everywhere and my life is useless. Now that I drew some like pretty gnarly stuff, disturbing stuff. Yeah. yeah, I don't think at that age actually. I think it was actually younger. Younger, yeah. Um, but but usu it usually is younger. You know, but yeah. mostly like sci-fi kind of things, and like yeah. I remember being like ten or so and and drawing some fairly disturbing pictures of uh, of um, like bombs and guns killing people in Libya because that was the thing at the time. Like Reagan <laughs> was bombing Libya, and we were all on board because Libya needed to be bombed because terrible Gaddafi, you know, et cetera. Yeah, because. Uh, the you know the propaganda reaches all the way down i guess it does yeah but um the i i think the phrase to have keyed in on in this case i should have switched to a short sleeve shirt before we started recording here um <laughs> is the my life is useless yeah like that's that's a warning phrase yeah now generally that's more of a warning about suicide than homicide but still yeah um but again, the parents, like, they didn't even pull him out of school or anything. Now, so, but here's the question then that that arises here, is that, okay, probably his teachers spent more time with him than his parents did. Yeah. Why aren't they being held liable? Yeah. It seems that the principal didn't express with enough force that this was something serious to make the parents feel like they even needed to bring him out of school that day. Yeah. Um, or to do anything about it, I guess later, like I'm a little confused on the timeline here. The mother did figure out that the gun was missing that day. Yeah. It may have been after the shooting already started. I'm not real sure about that, but, yeah. um, like it does seem a little odd that at this point too, that they wouldn't, you know, think, well, maybe we should look in this kid's backpack or something with all this going on. Well, I don't know. It's yeah. Don't, so I'm pretty sure I read somewhere and I may be getting my stuff confused that they have like, like they search backpacks and stuff at that school. And that one of the security guards had joked about how heavy the backpack was. Oh, really? I didn't see that. Yeah, um, that like when he was coming into school that day, like they had made the comments, "Oh, this is a heavy one here" or something, mm -hmm. but they didn't go through it. Yeah. So, hmm. well, um, it it seems that his parents were more concerned with their horses than they were with their kid. Yeah. Um, from what I read, uh, there seems to be like a level of neglect or just disinterest, um with the mental health stuff and the potential dangers of this kid with a gun and so forth that they just, they just didn't take it any of this seriously. Yeah. Um, and in, in some ways I get the impression and, and maybe this is just me uh, projecting from some people that I know of parents being more interested in being the kid's friend than being the kid's parents. Yeah. But I don't know at, at any rate, I am, I am, I am torn on this one. 
Like, it's weird to say that they're responsible and like how far my, actually my bigger how concern. How far does the responsibility reach? Yeah. Because now once you, once I'm you I'm worried start, about the precedent that's been set. Well, yeah. But once you start making somebody liable for somebody else's actions, like in any case, like those start to become funny lines and hard lines to draw. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I you mean, don't mean like comics. Do I? You don't mean like comics. You said funny lines. Oh, the yeah. First thing no. I thought oh, was, was, like, hmm. was like a comic book. Like the no. funny pages kind of. <laughs> yeah. No, like, I mean, where do you draw the line? Just like mm-hmm. what you were saying with, well, shouldn't the teachers be have some liability here? The principal, maybe the security guard. Like, I mean, once you go down that road of holding someone else responsible for somebody's actions, mm-hmm. like, it's, it's just a hard thing to do. Yeah. I mean, are the parents responsible if the kid goes to somebody else's house and uh, has too much to drink and has a car wreck on the way home and kills somebody? Yeah. Well, and the car thing kind of comes into play here, too. Mm-hmm. Because if you have a young kid do something stupid in the car, mm-hmm. like we're going to hold the parents accountable for that. Yeah, I mean they gave him the car. Yeah, you know they, you know they're yeah they're supposed to be uh, overseeing this to some degree. Yeah, I mean mm-hmm. especially when they go a they step further. They didn't teach him to drive properly, obviously. You know? or, yeah. Well, I mean they gave him the car and then he stole their liquor. It was their liquor he was drinking. Yeah, you know I mean it, it's just it's. Anytime you're trying to hold somebody else responsible for somebody's actions, I think it's a dangerous road. Now, mm-hmm. I'm, like I said, this one's tough because, like, I do have on some level believe that there is some kind of responsibility when you turn a kid loose with the gun like that. Even yep. if, even you say it's, it wasn't like in his room or whatever, but mm-hmm. even still, like, there's, there's a danger there. And there, yeah. there is a responsibility as a gun owner to, to, you know, ha- keep them, um, put up responsibly. Yeah, I'm I'm actually more concerned here with the disregard for the mental health signs. Yeah. Um that it seems like a complete disregard for the kids' well being and uh and and that's the part that I think is the the thing is that makes the, them more liable. The liable yeah. yeah in this case. Um I don't know. It's it's a hard question, but I am I am worried about the precedent that it sets. And this is like this was a good case to pursue because there's so many reasons that you can find to blame the parents for what happened later. Yeah. Um, with their, um, kind of ignorance or, or disregard for the issues that he was having, um, for actually providing the weapon and, and, um, not securing it in any way. Um, the, you know, like there was a, a text from the mother that, was some like the kid had gotten in trouble for something. I can't remember. Oh, he was looking at, he was looking at bullets online on his phone at school. Yeah. And, um, the, you know, the teachers contacted her about it and she, and when she contacted him, she was like, all right, well just don't get caught doing that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I don't know. Maybe this is, yeah, maybe we're ignoring some signs. Here. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I think that that's the part of it that makes them more liable and there's so many reasons that that anybody like even like hardcore libertarians like us can find to say it seems like they bear some responsibility here yeah, yeah. and so certainly some people that are more um persuaded by those arguments to begin with or are absolutely on board with this I'm sure yeah. and uh both conservatives and liberals and so this makes it a very easy case for them to to use as a test case yeah, uh, about whether they can do this kind of thing. Um, and it's like middle-class white family. So there's no accusation of any kind of ism. Yeah. Um, and, uh, but now the precedent is set and the question is like to use a, a jurors, you know, judicial phrase, like, are future applications of the this going to fall under the same kind of strict scrutiny that this this did? Yeah. Or is this going to be used in the future as leverage against you know single parent households, poor kids, yeah, et cetera, to try and you know scare them straight? Well, we're you know if you get involved in uh, you know gang stuff, then we're gonna we're gonna put your mama in jail. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. Um, I, I wonder about that. Now I mentioned that to somebody 
a, a friend of mine, and uh, and he said, "No, absolutely not. That would never be used that way because they want that poor violence." <laughs> wow, <laughs> <laughs> the argument to be made for that. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so. I don't know. Maybe that's not really the concern, but it, I, I do think that it's a strange precedent to set to hold somebody else responsible for the actions of a of a third party. Yeah. Um, in this case, you know, like the question about whether the teachers should have some liability in this too. The answer to that is pretty easy. Well, the teachers don't have a legal responsibility for the child like the parents do. Yeah. Um. So there's answers to some of this other stuff, but yeah. I don't know. To me, the other thing that I kept thinking about while I was, and it doesn't apply directly here, but um, is this idea that it seems like the government or the state wants to take more and more control over your kids anyway. Yeah. The Okay, well, they have to be in school from the time they're four until they're 16 or five or whatever, until yeah. they're 16. Um, we get them eight hours a day. You get them, you know, four to six other than sleeping time and yeah, you know, yeah. um, you know, we, and, and there's so many teachers out there that feel like they're responsible for these kids that they, they want to parent these kids instead of the parents parenting the kids. Now, some of that is teachers, they don't want to parent the kids, but they feel like they have to but because the parents aren't, parenting aren't doing the kids, it, yeah. you know, there's yeah. that too. But, um, it, it does seem like one of those situations or, or it kept coming to mind this idea that like, okay, we're responsible for this until something goes wrong. Yeah. And then it's somebody else's then responsibility. Else somebody else's, yeah. I don't know that that, I, I don't actually think that that's the case in this particular situation, but. But it could be at some point. Yeah. If, um, if we follow down this road. I don't know. This is just a strange thing to, like, I don't know what the libertarian answer on this is. No. Um, I mean, if you provide yeah. a weapon to somebody that has given you signs that they're ready to engage in some kind of violent attack. Should you be held liable? Well, yeah, probably. There's an argument for it for sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you came to me one day and was just like, Hey, I need to borrow one of your guns. Yeah. <laughs> well, for, first off, that's never going to happen. Well, I, know. <laughs> I have plenty of my own. I promise. Yeah. But well, that makes it even stranger, you see. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. <laughs> um, you want somebody else's prints on that gun. Always yeah. have a second set of prints on a weapon. Absolutely, right? yeah. Uh, but, like, I, you know, you're my best friend, and I would still be like, well, what do you need it for? <laughs> right? You, you'd ask some follow-up questions, yeah, I'm sure. I mean, and if things didn't add up, I wouldn't give you the gun. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> so if, if I just gave you the gun without asking any questions and you went and, and like robbed the local liquor store with it or something, yeah. should I be held liable for that? Yeah, probably. Yeah. Yeah. Like I enabled this. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, and I, I didn't do any kind of due diligence to try and prevent it. Dissuade either. me. Yeah. 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 Um, even if I didn't know exactly what you were going to do, like yeah. it's a strange request and yeah, just be handing out guns to folks. Yeah. Like. <laughs> and like for how long? Well, I only need it for an hour or so. Like, what are you going to do? I mean, like this is a, yeah. this is a strange situation. <laughs> so you really got to get that TB fixed, man. I know it. <laughs> um, so I, I don't, yeah, I, I think yeah. that there, I, I don't think that it's unreasonable to hold them liable. Yeah. For this. I think that they were they contributed to the violence. It's just weird to say they contributed to the violence through inaction, but there was there was a lot of reason for action. Yeah. That they didn't take. Yeah. I don't know. It's just a hard call though. Yeah. I I mean it, it's just a it's a scary road to go down. Yeah. Like I say. I don't like that the precedent's been set, and I hope that that any time this is applied in the future, that it will be this kind of just like really out there kind of case that seems that that it has to meet some kind of pretty strict cr criteria. Yeah, yeah. Um, my concern is that that's just not how the judicial system works in this oh, country. Oh, it's, it's <laughs> definitely not how it works. <laughs> so, so uh, 
we got some attorneys that listen to this. Like, I would really love to hear your commentary on this. Yeah. So oh. contact me, call me, send me an email, something. I'm, I'm really interested what, what an, uh, particularly a criminal attorney would think about this, about this situation. Like, I, I'm, I would like to have the insight. I actually probably should have called some people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now that I'm thinking about this, I should, I yeah. should have made some. We'll definitely calls, have some contacts on that. Yeah. So, uh, maybe um, for next week. Yeah. Well, maybe. Yeah. Um. Anyway, let's move on from that because this next thing. It's going to take longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a little bit more to dive into on this one. Sorry, I need to take a drink and <laughs> Liberty Larry can't fill gaps. No, not, not really um, good at that. So the next thing, we so we talked about the Missouri versus Biden case a while back. Okay. This is the case about um, social media censorship from the... Uh, the administration from the executive branch. Yeah. And the accusation is that the, it, that it's a violation of the first amendment. And uh, there were two courts that upheld that idea. Um, the appeals court with uh, fifth circuit, I think uh, appeals court rolled back some of the injunction that had been placed by the first court. But even they said like, there's definitely or there's good reason to believe that a line was crossed. Yeah. And they upheld a, a portion of the injunction also. Um, well, now this has gone up to the Supreme Court. Oh. So, of course, the first question is whether anybody involved had standing. Um, I don't really understand all that, so I'm going to skip it. Yeah. But the... Um, I'm assuming they decided they did. Yeah, at least so far. Yeah. Yeah. Enough to keep going. Okay. Because they were like, it's two states and five individuals, but the truth is if any one of them ha has standing, then the court needs to address it. Yeah. So they kind of moved on from there. Yeah. Now, the defense of the state, the state's power to censor here, their argument is essentially the... It was a polite request. Yeah. <laughs> And the social media companies can do with it what they will. Yeah. The problem is, is the mafia uses polite request. Right. And <laughs> and that's how the lower courts addressed it, too, is that it seems yeah. like uh, it would be a shame if anything were to happen. To, you know. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, the <laughs> Supreme Court, I don't know. I'm actually, I'm actually kind of pessimistic about how this is going to turn out, but I'll talk more about that later. <laughs> All right. Let, let's set the base here. Um, so yeah, their position is essentially that these were just requests or encouragement, um, and that the social media companies often denied them. Um, and so it wasn't coercive in any way. And, uh, so it's not a first amendment issue at all. Yeah. And, or it's not a violation of the first amendment. At all. And the, the government is entitled to express its opinions about uh, information that's out there. Yeah. And, you know, any media company can do with that what they will. Yeah. So. Man, am I the only one that has a problem with the government even, like, having those type of opinions? You're not the, well, I'm, I don't have a problem with them having those opinions. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I, I don't feel like that's really the place of the government. No, okay, so then let me take the other side then. So the uh, the First Amendment defense is that um, the, well, um, essentially that it has an impact on their actions just by the power of the government. Yeah. Um, that it was coercive, that there is talk of uh, Section 230, um, which, of course, is something that has come up in hearings and so forth many times, like, well, well maybe we need to reevaluate your protections under Section 230, which says that um, a platform like these social media companies that is, that's content is user-created, they're not liable for anything that the users create. 
Yeah. Um, so then the question became, well, like maybe we're not treating them just as a, a platform like this. Maybe we should hold them liable for, um, for information that's posted by the users. Well, that certainly has a big impact on how much they censor. Yeah. Um, so there's also like big government contracts involved in this too. And so very early on, uh, Neil Gorsuch, uh, Justice Gorsuch, who I will tell you that from my listening, I like, I listened to the whole oral arguments. This is almost two hours. Yeah. Um, that guy is the best. Yeah. Uh, At well, least on well, this case, like he, I mean, that was the assumption when he, when they was put in, like he's the, the argument was, was he was a pretty libertarian judge. Yeah. Um, well, he's a, he's a, um, what do they call it? A, a, a Textualist or oh, whatever. textualist, yeah, 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 constitutionalist, something like something um, along those lines. Yeah, so uh, original interpretation. Yeah, I'm I'm gonna play a clip from him, but he very early on in the arguments is talking about um, the way that the government is interacting with these companies, and um, that they're talking about. Uh, regular meetings and that it's you know that we're a partnership and we're on the same side and um, you know the the threat of uh, changing how section 230 applies to them and demands so there's like this carrot and the stick kind of thing too um, and uh, that this this just seems different from how they would interact with other kinds of media companies. And let's just go ahead and play his clip. All right. Wow, I cannot imagine federal officials taking that approach to the, the, the print media, uh, our representatives over there. If you, if you did that to, to them, what do you think the reaction would be? And so I thought, you know, the only reason why this is taking place is because the federal government has got Section 230 and antitrust in its pocket, and it's, uh, to mix my metaphors, and it's got these big clubs available for, available to it. And so it's treating uh, Facebook and these other platforms like they're subordinates. Would you do that to the, to the New York Times or the Wall Street Journal or the Associated Press or any other big newspaper or wire service? Okay, so... <laughs> Make your comment. Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Well, the difference is with all of those publications that he named, they already have control over those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like, yeah. Through years of, I'm sure, the same stuff they're doing to the social media companies now. Well, and, and it might be. Um, but there, like, there were a few comments on just uh, how demanding and rude and so forth some of these interactions were. Yeah. Um, you know, like, uh, saying, you know, we like to see these, oh, and Matt Taibbi talked about this too with Twitter, yeah. um, that, you know, we'd like to see these accounts be banned or whatever. And then like a, a day later, why has no action been taken on this yet? <laughs> and that, that kind of thing. Yeah. And, uh, that that's just kind of unusual in, in these kinds of, um, media relationships and I'll just let Glenn, Glenn Greenwald in a actually in an interview with Matt Taibbi um interviewing Matt Taibbi I should say um comment on this because it, you know he's got the inside knowledge and I think that he could probably express this better than I can yeah. you know I was you know talking earlier and I know you've had this experience too but like when the government tries to convince you not to publish something but they know it's ultimately your decision they're very polite you know, they're trying their best to convince you, to persuade you, to give you information, to negotiate with you. Like, hey, maybe if you're going to publish this, you could withhold this. That was the experience I had throughout the entire Snowden reporting and other area instances when I've had classified documents and we've negotiated with the government or not even negotiated, but just gave the government an opportunity to look, persuade us. And usually they don't persuade us, but the way they behave themselves is very, very deferential because the power is in our hands because they know the ultimate decision rests with us. That makes sense to me. Yeah. No. I mean, right. like, yeah. we need something from you. We're not going to be mean. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, 
Well, they know they don't have the leverage there, mm -hmm. but they know with the social media companies that they do have the leverage. Right. Um, just because of the... With the, those bludgeons that Gorsuch talked about with the Section 230 stuff, with exactly. the antitrust stuff. Yeah. Um, that, that, that makes a big difference. I... Uh, there's a whole bunch of clips back to back to back here, I know, but... Um, <laughs> We need to prove a point. Yeah, well, and I, I think it's better to use their own arguments. Yeah. The So when the um, defender of the First Amendment got up there, I, I thought this was kind of, this isn't all of it, and I'll, I'll address some other things too, but um, this is kind of, to me, the core of the argument for for defending the First Amendment here. Yeah. So, Your Honor, I guess this goes to the, the bully pulpit as well, as I understand that the bully pulpit has never been used uh, to target the object of suppressing a third party's speech. You can use it to coerce behavior, you can use it to coerce companies to take certain actions, but when the government is identifying a specific viewpoint and specific content that it wishes to wholly eliminate from public discourse, that's, I think, when the First Amendment problem arises. And I feel like I should add for content's sake here, or context sake, I guess, um, that this uh, suit arose from censorship around the COVID regime. Yeah. That this was about, like, you know, Jay Bhattacharya and uh, other professional um, medical doctors whose information or opinions or research was being suppressed on the social media platforms at the behest of the U.S. government because it was counter to their goals, I guess. Yeah. And a lot of this information turned out to be correct. Um, that the, uh, you know, some of the early ideas about how, um, about the infection uh, mortality rates or infection fatality rates, depending on, you know, which... Um, <laughs> phrasing you're using, whatever. I guess yeah. IFR is the most common thing. So infection fatality rates were um, were much lower than what they were saying originally. And so the government saying, or, or some of the early projections were saying it was like 3% and that it turned out to be more like 0.015 or something like that. And people were getting kicked off for, for those kinds of, uh, that kind of information. Um, that it turned out to actually be much more infectious, though. Um, so the people is essentially eliminating the possibility that masks and lockdowns were actually going to affect the spread. Yeah. But that kind of information was being suppressed. But that was all, turns out, to have been factual information, yeah. like actually correct, and right. it was being suppressed. Um, the other thing that... what. I would like to have heard him say, and he did kind of hint at this, but he didn't, he didn't say it outright. And I think it's important to say it outright, um, is that any government quote encouragement end quote is inherently coercive because of the power that rests in government. Yeah. Because of the power that, <laughs> that the government wields any encouragement that they give towards these kind of companies about what to do, is inherently coercive. Absolutely. Yeah, because the that's the government's the one thing that can end your business in a day. Yes. Like there's very few other things that can end it immediately. Mm -hmm. And the government's one of them. It's the biggest one for sure. Ask anybody that's owned a small business. They'll tell you real quick. Yeah. Stay out of their way. Yeah. Um and you know, there's a lot to be gained by getting in line with the government. Like they have the carrot and the stick. They got that stick, those big you know, the Section 230 and the antitrust stuff. But they've yeah. also got big contracts that they give out to these companies as well. Oh, There's yeah. a lot of money for them as well. Yep. Besides the fact that, that any of these decisions can affect their revenue, can affect their profit, and yeah. their profit matters to them. Oh, yeah. And, and the truth is that in a publicly traded company, they there's a... Uh, fiduciary responsibility for the board to do what's best for the company's bottom line. Yeah. 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 If that means going along with the government, that's just what it means. Yeah. So, um, something by the way that we should point out about TikTok after the discussion last week. Yeah. Um, TikTok's a capitalist business as well. Like yeah. they have already, you know, they've already censored information in the U S because 
it's good for their business in the U.S. Yeah. They don't want to get closed down in the United States. They're already getting in line, which is just more information or more evidence, I suppose, that it's not about, you know, the Chinese getting your data or that um, any kind of concern about what kind of information that they're pushing out to people. They they already censored themselves at the behest of the U.S. government to yeah. because there's money here. Absolutely. And so it's something some something else. No. Um that we speculated on last week. So go listen to that one. Yeah. But uh but I am concerned about this. Um there's I I don't think this is gonna go in favor of First Amendment. I think this this is gonna go in favor of the government uh, of state censorship. Uh or I'm you're not optimistic. I'm yeah, I'm not optimistic. And and yeah. let me explain why. So the the wisdom here would be well there's six conservative justices on the Supreme Court, so surely they're going to defend the, you know, rights of free speech because somehow free speech has become a right-wing thing where it has not traditionally been by the way. Yeah. Um the the left wing used to control the the free speech movement. Yeah. That's, that's the reason once upon a time everybody called me a left winger. Like yeah. I remember those days. Yeah. They're yeah. not that long ago. <laughs> <laughs> no, exactly. Um so my concern here though is that uh you know, like I said, traditional win- wisdom would say that you only need two conservative justice to justices to defect over to the state on this for the state to win. Yeah. Um there's three of them that I'm worried about. Yeah. Uh, Roberts is often a sellout. Yeah. <laughs> That's, um, he, of, he often changes sides, so to speak. Yeah. Now, the truth is that hopefully none of these justices really have sides in that way. Yeah. Um, that it's, it shouldn't be a partisan thing, but whatever. But I, is, I, I guess yeah. it's kind of become one no matter what. Yeah. I, I actually, I think that there's, an integrity in the justices that it's not really a partisan thing. Yeah. Um, but there is certainly a political outlook, like an idea of what all these things mean that this seems to fall on either the conservative or the liberal side. Yeah. So, I mean, I guess you can't fight that anyway. Yeah. Anyway, um, <laughs> I, I, th- Roberts is a potential defector. Um, uh, Kavanaugh almost certainly will defect. Yeah. Um, and the reason that Kavanaugh will defect is because he's a big believer in the security state. He really thinks that, you know, the government has a responsibility to protect people. Yeah. Well, more than that, actually, that's yeah. more Coney Barrett's position, which oh, is really? yeah. why I'm worried about her. Yeah. Um, but, uh, Kavanaugh's is more like, uh, that the government has, um, a duty to maintain secrets. Ah, gotcha. Yeah. That there's information that could the thing that he said twice in like to both of the attorneys, um, I mean he said once to each attorney. That's what I mean. Yeah. Twice in the thing was like, what if this threatens the war effort? Yeah. Yeah. Oh God, this guy. <laughs> yeah. He's Thanks, not, Trump. He's not <sighs> one of us. Yeah. No. Um. And uh, yeah, and Coney Barrett just falls down on that. Well, the government has some responsibility to protect people. Yeah. And what if there's bad information out there that's harming people? Like maybe the government does have responsibility. Now I'm hoping cause she seemed far more critical of the, the pro first amendment side, um, that she's just, uh, sh- that she's using that to try and sharpen her own arguments f- to call, come down on the first amendment side. Yeah. But I don't know. And I'm really uncertain. Yeah. Now, Katanji Brown Jackson and uh, Elena Kagan definitely coming down on the state side. Yeah. Sotomayor is a wild card. Yeah. Um, Sotomayor has been good on censorship issues in the past. Yeah. That oh. she's not generally in favor of government censoring public speech. Yeah. I, I actually think that she's going to come down on the First Amendment side. Nice. Um, which would mean that all three of the conservative justices that I have Wouldn't. concerns over yeah. need to defect. Um, Alito, Gorsuch, Thomas. Yeah. Thomas I'm not 100% on, but I feel pretty solid about. Alito yeah. and Gorsuch are definitely on the First Amendment side. <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Um, so, but this, it is a question. It's going to, yeah. it could go either way. And yeah. I, I am, I do have legitimate concerns that it'll come down, that they'll make a decision in favor of the state. Now we won't know for a couple of months. Yeah. Um, unless it gets leaked. Well, yeah, I don't think that'll happen again. <laughs> again. Uh, yeah. The fact that you say again. <laughs> well, I know, but that was a, that was a particularly hot political issue. And this one just isn't. For no, some I was going to say, I haven't, I mean, all of what we've talked about today has been news to me. Like it's not on the mainstream that I've seen. Yeah. Um, now let me play a clip from Kentaji Brown Jackson that this is the kind of thinking that's prevalent on the left, I would say, um, but that really concerns me. So let me go ahead and play one more clip. All Sorry, right. this is the last one. All right, All right. For today. but here we go. Biggest concern is that your view has the First Amendment hamstringing the government in significant ways in the most important time periods. Um, I mean, what would, what would you have the government do? I've heard you say a couple times that the government can post its own speech, but in my hypothetical, um, you know, kids, this is not safe, don't do it, um, is not going to get it done. And so I, I guess some might say that the government actually has a duty to take steps to protect the citizens of this country, and you seem to be suggesting that that duty cannot manifest itself in the government encouraging or even pressuring uh, platforms to take down harmful information. She said duty. <laughs> Several times. <laughs> um, okay, I probably should have said before, and if you have to go back and listen to the clip again, I'm sorry, but uh, her um, hypothetical was... What if there's a, a, a challenge that's on one of these social media platforms that's going around for kids to jump out of higher and higher windows? Oh, kind of like what, when we had the Tide Pod challenge? Yeah. Um, and that, you know, <clears throat> kids are, are getting hurt or even killed from jumping out of windows that are too high. And yeah. uh, doesn't the government have a responsibility to... Um, Man, you don't want to know that. My answer to that. <laughs> no, I do. I, what's your answer? To that? <laughs> my answer to that is, man, like we're thinning the herd as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> well, <yeah. laughs> I mean, if your kid's dumb enough to take that challenge, I'm just saying, man. There, like, yeah, there is a there is a case for that there too, <laughs> in there. But um, now the uh, the pro First Amendment attorney, um, his position was that the government has other actions that they can take, primarily. They can yeah. say, "Don't jump out of windows." This is the correct information. This is true information. This is the government line that this is a dangerous thing and uh, can be really hazardous to your health. And I want you to magnify that position. So well, what he keeps saying over and over again is that the, rather than taking other people's speech down, the government can project its own. Yeah. Well, that's fair. But here's the problem with that, and this is the thing that none of them will admit is that people don't listen to the stuff that the government says because the government is full of crap, like 90% of the time. Yeah. And everybody knows they're full of crap. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, like if the government tells you not to do it, you're like, oh, well, it might be a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> Why don't they want me jumping out of windows? Yeah, hmm. exactly. Some so, kind of conspiracy. Exactly. Well, <laughs> yeah. So, I guess. But that's the government's fault for ruining its own credibility. That's true. Um, like they bear the responsibility for that. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and it doesn't just have to be government. I mean, I would like to think that if that kind of challenge was going around, that there would be a lot of people up there, you know, <laughs> yeah. saying, uh, maybe construction workers saying, I fell off a ladder that high and I now it's have not, a broken back. That's, yeah, it's not know. a good idea. It's yeah. not a good day. <laughs> but the answer to her question, the initial, all right, so the, it's actually the first part of that clip that really disturbs me, where she's like, it seems that your position is that the First Amendment hamstrings the government in the most important times. Yes, that's exactly what it was written to do. Yeah, yeah. That, that, was, that is the that, purpose that of was, the First Amendment. That was the intent that the founders had. Yeah, is to yeah. hamstring the government. Yeah. It, it's government shall make no law. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Enough so, said. <laughs> Isn't it right there? Yeah. Um, yeah. That's, that's the society I want to live in. Well, I don't know about that. Yeah, um, I'm just saying. I like, I, 
I think rules are important. <laughs> um, rules or laws? Because I, I have a distinction. <laughs> there, there is a distinction there, but the the th- rules that I think really should be rules may as well be laws. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> um, kind of like gravity. No, not like gravity at all. <laughs> not like gravity at all. <laughs> That's a different. That's a, <laughs> fair enough. Um, so, but here's the because here's the real concern, like. The most dangerous lies out there in public are the official ones. Yeah. Are the state-sponsored lies. Yeah. The lies that get us into wars. The lies that, you know. Lock you in your home. Exactly. Um, So the official lies are the most dangerous lies anyway. It's not the public speech that needs to be censored. The government's speech is far more dangerous than any challenge going around or anything that any individual is saying out there. Yeah. So um, there was a New York Times article that was published, I think, Sunday, right before these oral arguments that were Monday. Yeah. Um, and it was full of what they would call misinformation, I think. <laughs> yeah. I read this article. I. There was a lot of nothing in it, yeah. first off, but the way they characterized this case was really strange. They suggested that the that the case, this First Amendment question, it's really about the, the pro-First Amendment people, those crazy right-wingers, yeah. um, essentially, are just trying to stop government's ability to fight right-wing extremism online. And uh, to prevent them from, uh, or, or to allow these crazy right wingers to continue to propagate election lies, and um, th- so they didn't even say that the case was actually about free speech issues that came up during the COVID regime. Right. And so they presented it in this light of that it's important to limit free speech online. Because otherwise, Donald Trump might get elected again. <laughs> That's essentially how the New York Times was framing it to yeah. their readership. Yeah. And it's just amazing to me how these kinds of issues have are no longer about any kind of principle or belief in um, freedom or independence that you would have traditionally associated with the left. Yeah. And that all of these things are being couched in the idea of, well, can't it's let, about Trump. Can't let the other guy win. Well, and when this time it's specifically Trump. It's specifically but I'm just, about Trump. Well, yeah. this has never really come up before in this way. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that it is specific to well, Trump because they've made Trump into such a a Trump is dangerous, a unique evil. <laughs> like, right. <laughs> that's right. that's the argument. Well, like, that, it is, and they've convinced enough people that they can they can get people that. I think historically would have been like, no, 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 wait a minute. You can't, you can't limit what people say yeah. <laughs> in the public forum. You can't limit political speech. You can't limit this kind. This is a thing that, that is protected. It's important. This is a civil rights issue. That's very important. Absolutely. And, but if you can couch it into the, the position of, well, this could permit Trump that that's enough that they have successfully propagandized people about this guy to such well, a degree. They think they have. I uh, I'm skeptical if you're if your average um even like non-Trump supporter like will buy into that type of of um argument. But but I don't know that, like I say. Well, I mean, I don't know a lot of the the people that this would apply to, but I I can tell you in that interview uh, that Glenn Greenwald and um, of Matt Taibbi, yeah, they do know some of those people, and they feel like they're susceptible. Yeah, I mean, and they may be right, like because because just like you were saying, like I just don't know that many people that I mean, I know some, but not not enough. And it, it's actually it's beyond the they think they may be susceptible. It's that the, they've gotten in arguments with people Over. that would have been good on this. Years ago, but and now Trump. Yeah, the unique evil has arrived. Um, it, it is important for a free society to have freedom of speech. The way to 
uh, to stamp out misinformation, disinformation or whatever is to allow it to, to be out there. Yeah. To be out there, to let people say it and let people argue against it. Yeah. Because, Um, because the, the, the marketplace of ideas will push the bad out. It it just will. Um, I was looking for this. It's not exactly what I, what I had in mind. I got a, uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn quote on this. This is the guy that wrote the Gulag Ar- Archipelago, which is a tough read, but I recommend to people cause yeah. you just have no idea. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but he said, uh, the prolonged absence of any free exchange of information within a country opens up a gulf of incomprehension between whole groups of the population between millions and millions. Yeah. And he's speaking from experience on that. Uh, we don't want to become a country where the government feels that it, it has certainly feels that it has a duty or even yeah. has the capability of limiting people's speech in the public sphere about anything. Yeah. Because in the, the most dangerous part about that, at least in my eyes is anytime you start banning speech or pushing it underground, it almost always turns violent. Um, and it, once, once you, people realize that they don't have a voice or they can't express their opinions, mm-hmm. they start expressing them in violence. Yeah, that's true too. Um, I mean, that's, and that's, we don't want that. Like we, we've got enough of that. If you don't give them a peaceful outlet, they'll find a violent one. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. That's true. So. That's not exactly the kind of thing I want to end on, <laughs> but we need to wrap up. We do need to wrap up. Um, so yeah, I don't know. I, I heard there's a bloodbath coming. Oh gosh! <laughs> do we? That, do you want to end on that? <laughs> we just laugh about that. I, I yeah. the thing that I'm amazed. All right, so it seems pretty clear in context that Trump was talking about that there would be a bloodbath for the auto industry. Yeah, because the, he because he wants to put a 100 percent tariff on cars come that China's bring are produced. China is building in Mexico and wanting to send to the U.S. Yeah. Well, the 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 ironic thing about that, um, or paradoxical, I guess, is that because of the trade deal that he created, yeah, is the reason they're doing that between they, the they, Mexico and Canada and the U.S. Yeah, he can't. I'm pretty sure. Oh, I mean, really? I, yeah, I don't think there's any way. Like, oh, I thought China this, found a loophole. Well, I was going to say this was a workaround that China came up with, right? Yeah, like, essentially, like if it's produced in Mexico. I'm pretty sure it can cross the border under this uh, trade agreement that, that yeah. Trump signed. Yeah. I don't think that he can make an exception or a carve out. It's too late. Yeah. It's, not, it's just not part of the agreement. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> that that's it's, the really funny. But the, but even worse than that, though, is that I, I've heard since then, it was pretty quickly exposed that the media was being ridiculous about this. Oh yes, pulling yeah. out pulling that phrase out out of context. Oh, and I heard and it all over it. mainstream media, and I was like screaming at the TV every time. I'm like, dude, like that 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 is is just underhanded. Yeah. Well, the craziest thing to me though is that I I heard on uh, No Agenda's show that came out yesterday that they've doubled down on this. Oh, yeah. I, I mean, they're not going like, to give up on Well, that. it seems like he's talking about the auto industry, but we don't know. And we know how he thinks. And obviously, this is still yeah. another dog whistle, blah, blah, blah. It's unreal. Yeah. Yeah. So, And it, it's just a, a sign of, um, see, we were going to laugh about something. Now I'm going to talk about something serious real quick before we finish. <laughs> yeah. it, it's just a sign of the, um, that we are incapable of discussing issues yeah. actually in politi- and in political discourse anymore. Yeah. Um, we don't talk about what people have done and what they're going to do. And well, in, in terms of how they're going to govern. Yeah. Wow. And so, I mean, it's just, it amazes me that they try to pull this because like we did have four years of Trump. Like, we know yeah. how Trump is going to govern. Like, yeah. I mean, you know. Well, not this time. Oh, this, this time. time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah I know. Well, I know. and that was, the, that was the ploy before last time. Well, when he's in his last term, he'll really, like, bust it open. Well, the one that really gets me is the, well, you know, we told you that he wasn't going to give up power. And see? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's see? The, January yeah. 6th. No, but he left office in January yeah. of 20. Like, he didn't. 
Yeah, he he, 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 he didn't, didn't, he didn't maintain bunker power. down he didn't, or yeah. anything. Yeah, yeah. So I don't understand. Like the and, point that you're trying to make is contradicted by your own example. And all I'm saying is, like everybody, go out and and look into all of this on your own. But dude, I'm just saying, January 6th was an inside job. I'm sorry. Ah, uh, well, like, I don't know if it's an inside job, but it, it certainly isn't what it's been. Cr- created into I don't like, know man the it, FBI it, it was not when as I serious say, as what well it wasn't as serious and when I say inside job I mean the FBI had people on the ground well, sure. and were facilitating this and there was obviously security people letting people in and yeah. you know there was a lot of that going there's on a too, lot of information out there that says that this this wasn't Trump trying to cause something that this was you know this was something else entirely yeah so, well it's a, a good excuse to uh to turn all of the apparatus that had been built to fight terror worldwide inward. Inward, yep. Absolutely. And hopefully they don't get another break here and have the Supreme Court fall on the side of the state. Yeah, because that's another link in the chain. Yep. All right. How was that a happy ending? <laughs> oh. Dang it. <laughs> Better? Is it, okay, it's an improvement. Yeah, I, I there was a hopefully so. in that last sentence, so yeah. we'll just we'll go with that. <laughs> All right. Well, we've gone on long enough, and th- and yeah, what the clips is going to be anyway. Uh, so we we're, we'll be back next week. Yeah. See no reason why not. I don't see any reason either. Um, I see no reason anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so yeah, we'll be back next week, and you can follow us on Facebook and subscribe on iTunes, YouTube and or Podbean. Uh, like and share, comment, subscribe. You can leave reviews. That it helps. Well, positive reviews helps. Yeah. Um, if you got negative reviews, you can email me at Michael at the Liberty Mike. Yeah, there you go. Uh, it's Michael at the Liberty Mike.com. And if you just, uh, if you have anything to say about this, email me anytime. I love to see them. Um, and I try to respond to them. Yep. Mostly. Mostly. Mostly successfully. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we'll be back next week when we finally get this right. And in the meantime, try to stay free. Life short, live free. Ciao. Later. Mm-hmm.